Welcome to this segment of Our Ventura TV. My name is Nicole Van Dam, and our guest today is musician, composer, and arranger Jimmy Caleri, who toured worldwide with America, among many other fun musical accomplishments. Thank you so much for coming today. It's very good to be here. Thank you. For those of our audience who might not be familiar with your work, would you mind sharing some of the highlights? Sure. I, I've been a professional player since I was 15 years old, starting back in Buffalo, New York. And uh, my first big break was a band called Raven out of Buffalo. We went to New York City and got on Columbia Records. We were opening for Led Zeppelin and uh, The Nice and Joe Cocker and uh, I played with B.B. King. Jimi Hendrix came and sat in with us. So that was kind of chapter one uh, with that band. And then uh, later, uh, a few years later, I, I joined the band America, which eventually brought me out to California and I got to tour the world with them. And uh, since then, I got really involved locally uh, arranging, composing, musical directing theater, which is something I had never done before, and uh, continuing to play and write and compose. I'm still doing it. That's a fabulous career. How did you come to play with America? In the early 70s, I was uh, called out to work with another artist named Ned Doheny, and he was managed by the same people that managed America. And uh, a couple years later, they remembered my work. They needed a keyboard player for America, and they called me, and uh, I flew out uh, after two days' notice and auditioned, and I got the job. So you had to learn all those songs in two days? Yes, yeah, kind of. <laughs> it and, was quick study. And learning pre-existing music, what's your process for that? Um, I usually make a chart. I will sit down and listen and make a little cheat sheet. I mean, if it's something more complicated, I'll, I'll go to greater greater lengths, but their music wasn't that difficult, but I had to be clear which song they were doing, so I, I made little charts, kind of listen. The other thing is I, you listen and absorb. That's part of it, too. And are there any software tools nowadays that would help with that process? Well, definitely now, but then it wasn't. It was pencil and paper. So, yes, I use a, 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 a notation software called the Overture, and there's others, Finale, and it's kind of like having a, a, a virtual uh, tablet. To, to make notes and is there anything that slows the music down or oh yeah yeah in fact if I want to listen if I want to listen to something and learn it there are, there are there is a software that's called the the amazing slow down or that will take a track and you could slow it down and sometimes I will do that or change the key and then you could sit there and notate or figure out what they're doing and sometimes I do that listen to it over and over and what about composing your own music I you composed for Raven Yes, yes, I did. Uh, and I, over the years, I've always been writing at some point. And uh, usually I, I write by, I'll just sit and play at the piano, which, which is my main instrument. And uh, sometimes an idea will come out and I'll start. I, I can kind of plant the seed of something. And then sometimes it'll go off and, and, and become a piece. And, that, uh, and at that point, then I would write things down, you know. And Overture would be the software nowadays that you would use. That's for that? what I use. It's not. It's not the main one that people use. A lot of people use uh, Finale and um, Sibelius, but it's like that. But I also use all the little tools. I mean, in the old days, it would be uh, you'd sit there with your cassette recorder and you'd tape it, you know, and then uh, then try to remember what you did. A lot of guys were pencil and paper people. Uh, I remember Keith Emerson, the late great Keith Emerson, when he, we were uh, playing at the same time in New York. And I was very impressed because I wasn't that literate, and he was always sitting writing. He was writing music all the time. He wrote a lot, and pencil and paper guy. But uh, the computer is kind of taking, helping out with that. I've heard you say that when you compose, you're a farmer. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm not a person who hears the whole song and then, then runs somewhere. I, I, I've got this great idea. I'm more, um, I start with something, an idea, and then I grow it. Usually something will lead to the next. So if I'll start with something and then see where it goes. Every now and then you sit down and play, the whole thing will come out. That, that's great when that happens. But more often than not, I'm a farmer. I'll start with something and I'll see where it goes. <laughs> you know. And very often, I mean, sometimes it's years later. I wrote a piece way back 30 years ago. 
And it always felt incomplete to me. So I never really performed it. And then one day I was sitting and I went, it needs a bridge. <laughs> and I wrote a bridge. And, and that was like 30 years later. So that's a very slow farming. <laughs> <laughs> slow that's a, it's like wine. Slow Got grow. better with time. Yeah. Now, what about when you're going back to your touring worldwide with, with America? You got a chance to see people from all over the world appreciate your music. That gives you a unique perspective. Oh. What do you think music means to the world? Well, I think it's universal for one thing, and, uh, and it's, it's very humbling. I, one, of the, one of my favorite memories was playing at the Budokan, which is a big theater in uh, Tokyo. And it actually is a place where uh, martial artists uh, perform. In fact, we toured the building and there was martial arts classes going on upstairs. The, the auditorium itself was a huge theater and we were, this is with America of course, and we were playing and the crowd was very polite. They're sitting, they're rocking back and forth and then all of a sudden about three songs from the end, the entire crowd rushed forward to the stage. <laughs> they come swarm the stage and it was, it was overwhelming, and they're singing the song. I mean, they're Japanese, and they're, they're singing the lyrics. It was incredible. Uh, another thing that happened while we were there is we would go to the next city, and the fans, some of the same fans, would be there ahead of us. We have no idea how they got there, and they'd have their signs. And as is their custom, they would come, they were very polite, and they would give you gifts. Well, that's a very nice Yeah, I like, you know, pen and pencil sets and all these, you know, wonderful little items, you know. So you have keepsakes that oh, yeah. you are able to. Oh, yes. And what do you think music means to people in the world? What do you think the role of music is? Well, that's a good question. Um, my uh, road manager from America one time said, the purpose of the music is to make people feel that nothing can hurt me now. Uh, Another, another way to look at it uh, is, uh, it was from a great movie that I saw, it says the purpose of the music is to, to quiet the sound of the workman's hammers. Interesting. I, th I think it's to lift people up and to, to create a, um, uh, a wordless, although there are lyrics, but, but something that goes beyond uh, uh, intellect where we feel something, we're sharing something together. And uh, it really is one of the things that makes life worthwhile. It's been a very large part of your life. You know, in terms of, of mentors, you told me a fabulous story about Leroy Holmes. Do you oh, mind sharing that? <laughs> sure. I've had a couple of mentors in my life. I've had many mentors. Any, any of the great players that I listen to are mentors. And I, I did have a wonderful piano teacher when I was a kid. Anita Frank from the Vienna Conservatory. Uh, but later in life, I, I was in, in Ojai, and uh, I put up some signs to, to, for piano lessons, and an older gentleman came and started to take lessons from me. Maybe once a month he would call and come. And uh, in time, he saw that I was, his name was Leroy, Leroy Holmes. He saw that I was working on an arrangement, and he says, you know, I, uh, I studied a little bit of that during the war, and um, maybe I could send you something. And he started to send me these beautiful hand-typed uh, information sheets regarding musical arrangements, uh, uh, the ranges of the instruments, the pitfalls, what they're good for. And all and that, that is important to know if you're learning arrangements. Yeah, I mean, he gave me, the, he gave me uh, you know, a basic book and then exercises and so on. I mean, and I was trying to figure out how does he know all this stuff? So he would come for the lessons and I would show him what I had done as far as the arrangement and then he would pay me. So it turned out, it turned out I was invited to a 70th birthday party and I went and when I went in I was shocked to see that he was a very famous arranger and he had been Della Reese's arranger. He was the president of Everest Records and uh, he was Harry James arranger. So he had many stories and a lot of practical advice and I think of him as one of my, my great teachers. But he didn't want me to be intimidated, but he wanted to... What a wonderful yeah, story it was, though. It was, it was, he was a great teacher. In terms of practical advice, what advice would you give a musician who maybe already has their chops but mm -hmm. is trying to make a living from music? What advice would you give? Uh, 
show up on time, have a good attitude, know your material, um, be easy to work with, and if you don't like the gig, there will be another one coming that will be better. And continue to work on your craft, I would think. You need to work, you need to keep working on something, you know, to improve. It's just like um, Kobe Bryant. Apparently, uh, he wasn't that good with his left hand, shooting with his left hand. And he, as great as he was, he, all summer long, he would just, he would work on his game. The really good players or, or artists of any kind continue to work. And what about the negative voice that sometimes haunts creative people, people trying to build something that hasn't been built before, like an entrepreneur? What's your advice for dealing with that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you just have to keep going. You have to keep going uh, uh, in spite of it and get, pick yourself up and keep, and, and, and keep at it. And, and get yourself, if something is really, I remember I was doing a gig one time that just was was not good. It just was not good. And I remember I had a vision that that I had a sore in the middle of my chest that was, and that was sort of my inner man saying, "Get out of here." There are times where you have to say, "That's enough. I'm done." Yeah, I'm to moving know. along. If something is toxic, you know, you got to move along. Yeah, it, it just isn't right. And and, uh, and for those seeking creative inspiration, what would you? I would say always listen to different kinds of music. Listen to the listen to really good music of any kind, and don't don't get yourself stuck. Uh, you know, just listening to what. I, I remember I worked with a drummer who was a great blues drummer, and he, we would drive. He says, "Yeah, I just listened to blues," and I thought to myself, "Maybe you should listen to something else. <laughs> <laughs> You're already good at that. You know, maybe you should, you know, listen to some Peruvian folk music for something. You know." And the other thing is, I would say to any uh, anybody doing this, is that it really your your performance comes down to the superior execution of fundamentals. In other words, you you've got to be able to do the simple thing and do it very well. I mean, that's what I tell my students. You know, do re mi, nice and clean. <laughs> you know, it's, you, and you build on that. You know. Sadly, we're almost out of time, so we really? have to wrap it up. I know okay. it went fast. Oh, that went fast. Is there a website that people can go to for more information? Yes, I, I have Jimmy Caleri at gmail.com, and I also have Jimmy Caleri.com. Dot com. Jimmy yeah. at gmail. Gmail is your email. Yeah. Yes. Jimmy Caleri. Oh, com. you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jimmy Caleri.com. <laughs> Thank you for fixing that. And do you have a concluding thought, maybe, that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I would just say uh, you follow your passion. But also know that that it, it has to be practical, and you need to you need to work on your to work on it and to improve your skills as you go along. You know, very quickly, what I tell my students is the mountain is out there. You can see it in the horizon. Keep walking toward it. You never get there, though. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This wraps it up for today's session of Arventura TV. This is Nicole Van Dam signing off. Be well and happy till next time.